Most of you know that the two most important items a mason uses are his trowel and his mortar. However, these two components may be about the only consistent elements you'll find when any two masons begin a job. Working styles, habits, even the use of tools is as different as the number of individual craftsmen. But there's one important detail that must remain consistent, no matter who is doing the job. Proper workmanship. Today, we're going to show you some of the most important elements which make up proper workmanship and why they're necessary for strong, water-resistant walls. Master Mason Pat Howley of S-Rock Materials, manufacturers of Bricksmet Masonry Cement, will demonstrate some of the common problems associated with improper workmanship, why they are problems, and how to overcome them for stronger, water-resistant, and even better-looking masonry walls. Let's begin with one of the most important processes, how mortar is mixed. Desirable mortar always has certain characteristics. It's workable, which means it sticks to the trowel when it's picked up, yet it slides off the trowel easily when it's spread. Good mortar is also plastic, which means it's easy to spread. Along with these characteristics, it's also important to point out what makes a proper mortar mix and what effects different mixes can produce. A proper mix should be one part masonry cement to two and one half to three parts sand and mixed for five minutes. If greater proportions of masonry cement are added to the mixture, it will become too rich. On the other hand, greater proportions of sand will lead to an overly sandy mix. Rich or sandy mixes lead to different sets of problems. Here you can see a proper mix. A trowel forms ridges which stand up firmly without slumping. It spreads smoothly on the brick or block and stays firmly in place. A rich mix has too little sand. It is easy to pick up on the trowel, but it can easily smear on the face of the brick. An overly sandy mix is not as strong as it should be. It slides too easily off the trowel and the masonry unit. The bond is weaker when the mix is too sandy. Once the mortar has hardened properly, a new set of problems may become evident. Let's take a look at the results of these problems we built into these test panels. What I have here is an illustration of the different amounts of sand that you can get in, charged into the mixer at one time. Here on the bottom, I have essentially a one part masonry cement to one part sand, which is, we will call a super rich mix. In the center, we have a standard mix of one part masonry cement to two and a half to three parts of sand. And in the top, I have a super sandy mix, which essentially is one part masonry cement to nine parts of sand. Now, an identifying factor of the super rich mix is a very glassy, smooth joint. But that in itself, being a super rich mix, causes problems within itself because it will have shrinkage cracks, and they do show, and those shrinkage cracks, which are illustrated right there, is a point for water to enter into the wall. And here in the center, we have the recommended mix, one part masonry cement, the two and a half, the three parts sand. And here on the top, we have the over sanded mix, one part masonry cement to nine parts sand. The problem with this over sanded mix is that it reduces bond, it reduces strength, and it also creates a very porous mortar joint which will absorb moisture. When making the initial mortar mix, sand measurements are very important. Here you can see that six number two shovels of dry sand yields less volume than six number two shovels of damp sand. In any case, the correct amount of sand for mixing mortar to ASTM C270 proportion specifications is two and one half to three cubic feet of well-graded sand to one bag of masonry cement. Also, sand color can have an amazing impact on the final appearance of a masonry wall. This panel was built to show the dramatic effect that different colored sands can have on the final appearance of the masonry wall. This also shows you why you shouldn't change sand suppliers during construction. And this is the sand from the southeast, the very light sand that makes the very light joint. 
And this sand is common to northern Illinois. And this sand is common to my area, the Ohio Valley. Now that we've discussed the proper mix, let's examine the proper working practices with that mortar. I'm going to start laying brick. And the idea is really, you've carried this mortar to the wall once, don't take it off and throw it back there. Take it off and put it on that brick. But when you get ready to put another brick on there, you put a full head joint and a full bed joint and squeeze it together. Now I'm going slow because I want you to see what I'm doing, but in the same respect, when you're out there laying brick, making a living, you, uh, you can't take this much time. But let me tell you something. If you don't take this much time, you may be liable uh, for some damages. Now let me illustrate once again what I'm talking about on that full head joint and full bed joint. After taking these brick off, it shows the full bed joint and the full head joint giving total protection and a strong wall. And over here, I'm going to do something that they do quite frequently, and that's furrow a mortar joint too deeply. Now we're illustrating the poor head joint, or the almost zero head joint, which is kind of typical in the industry today. Looks good on the face. Now I'll take these brick off that I put on here with a deeply furrowed bed joint and the, the very slim head joint, and you see what kind of a problem it causes. It leaves, it leaves a, a trough down in there for the water to, and, and when it's raked here, you're reducing the amount of protection from Mother Nature. Now after the joints have been spread and the masonry units positioned, the joints must be tooled properly. This serves two purposes, to give the wall the appearance designed by the architect and to aid in making the joints water resistant. Pat will illustrate the three most common types of tooling and explain the advantages and disadvantages of each. A rake joint is where you rake or scratch out some of the mortar. Uh, the most common tool used is a skate raker. Uh, the most common depth is about a quarter of an inch. So if you only have a quarter of an inch on that head joint and you come along and rake that out, you really, you're really digging for trouble. But the other, the other situation is that, that the bricklayers like this, this rake joint because they can leave, they can build this whole wall, this whole wall here without striking. There is a proper time to strike and if you see how it tears the joint. It just, it just literally tears the mortar out of that joint. And it also leaves a ledge there for the water to um, lay on until it soaks into that joint. Now, if, if, you, if you think you have to have a rake joint, then the idea is, is to get a, a rake joint and then, and then slick it with, a, with a, another tool to compress that joint. The convex striker is a very, very safe joint, because you see here where this mortar is uh, has just been cut off with a trial, and when, when you strike it with this convex joiner, makes a concave joint, it compresses that mortar joint. And you can see the difference here. You get a totally different uh, look or a totally different appearance. It does accentuate the brick, but it is very, very dangerous because the water lays on that on that, that bed, um, on this ledge here, and soaks back into that very porous joint. Now, another joint that is very safe is what we call grapevine joint. And uh, we'll demonstrate it here. Now, it's, it is still a tool that compresses the mortar joint. It does compress the mortar joint and makes a slick surface and uh, resists the penetration of water. But the idea 
of a grape a grapevine joint is not to drag it straight through the joint. You never see a grapevine growing straight. The idea is that, that the grapevine joint does want to wiggle a little bit. There's also a proper and improper time to strike the joints, and it can make a substantial difference in the final appearance of the finished wall. There's one proper time and two improper times to strike a joint. The proper time is when the joint is, is firm to the touch and, and no mortar comes off on your thumb. The first improper time is right after the brick was laid and the mortar joint is very, very wet. It will smear and, and cause the joint to be very light. The other improper time is after the joint has dried completely and you try to strike it, it takes much effort to strike and also it'll turn the joint black. While we're talking about appearance, this would be a good time to discuss the practice of retempering mortar. Once mortar has been mixed and transferred from the mixer to the mason's board, it begins to lose water. Stiffening can be brought about by evaporation of water from the mortar and hydration of cement. Water may be added from time to time to maintain workability. This practice can lead to problems with strength and the final appearance of the wall. Each time you retemper, you lighten the color. As you can see, this mortar is darker. It was used right out of the mixer. The more you retemper, the lighter it gets, also decreasing bond and strength. In most cases, retempering is not a good idea. When daily work is completed, it is recommended, and an excellent practice, to cover it with six mil plastic or a similar covering. This serves two purposes. It protects the wall from rain or other moisture entering the wall. It also protects against the excessive evaporation of moisture during hydration. Make sure that your covering cannot be blown around, leaving openings for moisture to enter the wall. Now let's return to the panels we originally constructed in order to demonstrate the results of the built-in weaknesses. Remember how we purposefully designed weak head and bed joints in these panels? Let's conduct a little demonstration here to show what happens when these types of problems, which are all too common in the industry, find their way into the final construction. To the back of each of these panels, we have attached a tank to hold water in contact with the finished wall. The panel on the left has the properly constructed bed and head joints, while the panel on the right has the faulty construction. As the water is poured into the tanks, watch what happens. As you can see, the panel with the faulty construction allows the water to move almost at will through the wall and then leak through the weakly constructed joints. Let's review what we've learned through the preceding information. One, proper workmanship is absolutely necessary to produce strong water-resistant walls and better-looking masonry walls. Two, well-mixed and properly proportioned mortar sticks to the trowel and spreads easily. Three, a proper mortar mix is one part masonry cement to two and one half to three parts sand. Four, the color of the sand is very important to the final color of the mortar in the finished wall. Use the same sand throughout the entire construction project. Five, tooling the mortar joints with the correct tool at the proper time will provide better water resistance and better looking finished walls. Six, under many circumstances, mortar should not be retempered during construction. Mix new mortar instead for consistent color and a more uniform appearance. Seven, full bed joints and full head joints are essential to strong water resistant masonry walls. These instructional notes have been presented by Bricksment, a leader in the production of masonry cement for over 75 years.